subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect Hello viewers welcome to Newsweek South Asia a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations let's begin with the headlines first Indian security forces achieve success in fight against cross border terrorism in Kashmir Delhi police arrest Khalistani terrorist Sukh Bikriwal upon his deportation from Dubai An Islamabad hoodwinks world by indicting Hafiz Said in another terror financing case. The year 2020 was the most challenging but a successful year for the security forces in the Kashmir Valley. Since the abrogation of Article 317 in August 2019, there were terror threats emerging from across the border. But Indian security forces successfully executed operations to flush out the terrorists. Kashmir Valley witnessed frequent encounters during the year that resulted in the killing of the highest number of terrorists compared to previous years. A report. On December 30, Srinagar's Loyapura witnessed an exchange of fire between the security forces and terrorists which finally resulted in the elimination of three dreaded terrorists. Security forces had asked the trier to surrender. but the ultras fired indiscriminately and even lobbed grenades at the security forces triggering an encounter this confrontation just added to the long list of successful operations of security forces in the valley in 2020 kal sham ko national highway ke bilkul pass noora hospital ke opposite hmd area mein specific input mili thi ke wahan pe kuch terrorist ne पना ली है उसके बाद आर्मी जेकेपी और सीआरपीएफ द्वारा ज्वाइंट ऑपरेशन लॉन्च किया गया जो पूरी रात चला और आज साढ़े ग्यारह बजे जब ऑपरेशन खत्म हुआ तो उसमें तीन टेररिस्ट जो हैं उनको मार गिराया गया According to official data, terror outfits suffered significant losses in 2020 as top commanders of Hizbul Mujahideen, Jaish e Mohammed, the Al Qaeda affiliated Ansar, Ghazwatul Hind and Lashkar-e-Taiba outfits were killed in various gun battles across the Kashmir Valley. However, throughout the year Pakistan was engaged in a hatching conspiracy to destabilize the Kashmir Valley. It even formed the resistance front which came in limelight through various audio messages circulated via social media. TRF had owned most of the attacks carried against the security forces in the valley. The resistance front is nothing but the old wine in new bottles formulated by the Pakistan ISI and the Pakistan army. This has been done to try and avoid Pakistan being blacklisted by the FATF. Ever since Pakistan was placed on the grey list by the FATF, Pakistan has been trying to rename all militant organizations, whether they are in Pakistan itself or whether they are functioning in Kashmir Valley, and try to tell the world that look, we have banned these organizations. But on the other hand, what is the actual fact is that all these organizations, once they would change their names. and they would carry on their work as charitable organizations and the main thing to see is that they garnered such a lot of funds under the grab of the charitable organizations which money was funneled into fueling extremism in jammu and kashmir terrorists have changed their modus operandi and adopted guerrilla warfare which is hit and run tactics as was seen in many terror attacks carried by terrorists against forces in the valley 
terrorist targeted security personnel deployed for naka checkpoints and road opening parties it is also being observed by security forces that these terrorists often choose Srinagar's outskirts or highways for terror attacks on security forces. There are several reasons behind it. Security forces in Kashmir Valley have strengthened their intelligence network and improved coordination. Their concerted efforts have tilted the scales in their favor. Although Pakistan has been trying all its efforts to create instability in the valley, the vigilant security forces in India have failed its tactics. There is a long list of Khalistani fugitives living in the foreign soil. These absconders launch concerted secessionist campaign with the sole intention to motivate like-minded Sikh youngsters and others to join the so-called Khalistan movement. Many of them are target killers who are operating at the behest of Pakistan's ISI. Recently, Delhi police arrested a similar pro-Khalistan target killer, Sukh Bikriwal, after his deportation from Dubai. A report. Recently, the special cell of Delhi police arrested a Khalistani terrorist, Sukh Bikriwal, at the Delhi airport following his deportation from Dubai. Sukhmeet Pal Singh, also known as Sukh Bikriwal, had entered the crime world in 2012 as a drug trafficker. As per the reports, he was operating at the behest of Pakistan's notorious spy agency, Inter Services Intelligence, ISI, and was behind several targeted killings in Punjab. Bikriwal was also involved in the murder case of Shauri Chakra recipient Balvinder Singh Sandhu. The wanted terrorist had played an important role in the sensational 2017 Nabha jail break in Punjab's Patiala, during which two terrorists and four gangsters escaped. The recent arrest of a Khalistani terrorist clearly indicates that Pakistan continues to use terrorism as an extension of its foreign policy and its military policy. The ISI is wanting to capitalize and exploit fully the farmers' agitation as well as forthcoming important events like the Republic Day Parade as well as the elections in Bengal, etc. to its advantage. Pro-Khalistan propaganda is a long devious design perpetrated by the Pakistani intelligence agencies to create a dent in India's sovereignty. Recently, a report released by the McDonnell Laurier Institute entitled Khalistan, a project of Pakistan, alleged that Khalistan is a geopolitical project nurtured by Pakistan and threatens the national security of not only Indians but also Canadians. The report also questioned the maps of the proposed Khalistan, noting that they do not depict even one inch of traditional lands in Pakistan, not to Lahore, where Maharaja Ranjit Singh ruled over a Sikh empire over 200 years ago, or even to Nankana Sahib, the sacred birthplace of Guru Nanak, the first Guru. It appears that Pakistan wants Sikhs to be free, but not in Pakistan. Pakistan has been making desperate attempts to gain a foothold in India. However, it has failed to gather any traction amongst the masses of Punjab. Khalistan na bana tha, na banega, na kabi banne denge. Jab Khalistan banega, pehle ki tarah hamari lashon se nikal ke chale jayega. Rast ek hai. और राष्ट्र एक रहेगा और पंजाब हिंदुस्तान का हिस्सा है और पंजाब हिंदुस्तान रहेगा इन सिरफ्रंडम के पीछे आईएसआई है चेहरे आगे कोई और हैं टेररिस्टों के वो टेररिस्ट जिन्होंने दिल्ली ब्लास्ट किए जिन्होंने पंजाब में ब्लास्ट किए जिन्होंने बहनों के सुहाग उजाड़े जिन्होंने बच्चों को यतीम किया बम्बों और गोलियों से वो टेररिस्ट हैं और उनके पीछे आईएसआई है ये टोटल क्लियर हो चुका है in addition to it, ISI regularly instructs Pakistan-based pro-Khalistani terrorist groups to utilize and establish smuggling channels on the international border of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, Jammu and Kashmir to smuggle weapons into the Indian territory. 
However, to its great disappointment, the ongoing persecution of Sikh minorities in Pakistan and the exploitation of Khalistanis for money-making through drug trafficking has created a rift between Khalistani elements and the ISI and they are increasingly ditching the Pakistani agency. Seeing the failure of its Khalistani plan, the ISI has geared up the handful of Khalistani forces remaining with it to launch intense anti-India propaganda. India is also concerned over the recent attempts by the extremists and Khalistani elements to influence the decision-making process and polity in foreign countries. The proposition of an independent Khalistan is a proposal without economic and democratic logic and loved by the very Punjabis whose lives it would most directly affect. Referendum 2020 would definitely be a test case for some key foreign states as to whether they have matured as democratic liberal nations or been reduced to breeding grounds for separatist modules from across the world. The dreaded terrorist Hafiz Saeed has once again been prosecuted by Pakistan. At least it appears so. Saeed has been sentenced for over a 15-year jail term in another terror financing case. However, the observers have termed it a farce. They call it Islamabad's tactical move aimed at building up its case before the Financial Action Task Force that has kept it in its grey list since 2018. Islamabad has been facing a multiplying global pressure to crack down on the terrorists who are expanding their bases in the country and launching attacks on other countries. This man openly spewing venom against India is UN proscribed global terrorist Hafiz Saeed, the supreme commander of Lashkar-e Taiba and Jamaat ud Dawa, the two terror outfits responsible for carrying out several terror attacks, including the 2008 Mumbai massacre. He has an unbridled access to almost everywhere in Pakistan. He carries rallies, holds meetings, and even gets a VIP cover while appearing in a court of law. He is no less than a state guest in Pakistan. Despite being presented with a number of facts confirming his involvement in several terror attacks, Islamabad has not acted against this man. Hafiz Saeed is periodically prosecuted by a court in Pakistan. He is sentenced to a rigorous jail time. Then he disappears from the public eye for a few weeks and returns to discourse as soon as the international media turns to a different news. The most relevant issue is that Pakistan government is worried about FATF. FATF has already destroyed its economy. Further problem, if Paki, uh, the government, Indian, Indian government or FATF succeeds in putting Pakistan in blacklist, Pakistan is doomed to destruction. And therefore, Pakistan is making attempt for image building to project itself that it is serious for acting against uh, terrorism. And that is the only clever move that Pakistan is playing. The drama of convicting Saeed is barely a subject of surprise because Pakistan for a very long time is known for initiating bogus counter-terrorism operations. Saeed was arrested by Pakistan in 2019 to show the world that Pakistan too is fighting terrorism along with other countries. He was sentenced for 11 years jail in February 2020 for two terror financing cases and later in November 2020, Saeed was slapped with another 10 years in jail in two more cases. Hafiz Saeed has already been convicted for 21 years imprisonment in four terror financing cases of late. The recent verdict takes the count to 36 years, but the critics are confident that he will not go behind bars for even 36 weeks. Pakistan has even defended his prosecution in the 2611 case, and his imprisonment is just a euphemism for protection and nurturing his safe heavens. Pakistan government has charge sheeted Hafiz Saeed on account of terror financing and it has deliberately kept silent on the issue of Hafiz Saeed's involvement in 26-11 case. You see between the two, 26-11 is more serious charge, more heinous charge. So Pakistan government has very cleverly, cleverly sidetracked the issue. 
same thing will be repeated time and again. Hafiz Said will be arrested and uh, the world community will be told that Pakistan government is serious, but because on account of uh, uh, no concrete evidence, Hafiz Said will be let off. So this cat and mouse game will continue and that is the technique of Pakistan. It will keep Hafiz Said also happy. It will try to, uh, it will attempt to keep world community, United Nations, FATF happy that it is acting against Hafiz Said. So it's a clever ploy. It is a clever technique used by Pakistan to save its image and also keep Hafiz Said happy. Such cosmetic actions are nothing but a move to get away with any serious action by terror financing watchdog FATF in the future. In June 2018, Pakistan was put on the grey list for terror financing. It was given two years to clean up its act and 27 action points to deliver. The deadline passed this year. In October 2020, a review was conducted and Pakistan failed. Pakistan was set to be blacklisted, but it did not happen. It was saved again and given another extension. Now it has time till February 2021. This repeated story has also raised questions over FATF's credibility, for it has proven toothless against a terror state. As per the existing procedure of FATF, the procedure says that if three countries out of 39 countries say no to putting Pakistan in blacklist, then Pakistan cannot be put in blacklist. And three countries are always there to support Pakistan, Turkey, Malaysia and China. And they are all weather friends of Pakistan. And therefore, theoretically, procedurally, Pakistan cannot be put in blacklist. So what does it signify? What does it in indicate that the rules of the game, the procedure, the functioning style of FATF needs to be changed and the rule of majority should be respected. Now Pakistan has found an escape route in its strategy of action before scrutiny. Not even the United Nations has taken note of it till now. In August before FATF's meeting, Pakistan imposed financial sanctions on 88 banned terror groups, including Hafez Said, Masood Azhar, Daud Ibrahim, and Zakir Rahman Lakhvi. However, in November, Pakistan's federal investigative agencies updated list of the most wanted and omitted the mastermind and key conspirators of the heinous Mumbai terror attacks. Several intelligence reports even suggest that Hafiz Said is being provided preferential treatment in the prison, including access to special facilities and visitors. Ironies and contradictions plague Balochistan, Pakistan's province that borders Afghanistan and Iran. This resource-rich land is now a dangerous brew of tribal separatism with great power geopolitics. A strong feeling of alienation from the center has led many Baloch nationalists to take up arms. They want to make themselves heard. The recent gun attack on the army personnel at a checkpoint in Hanai region of province exhibits the radical and aggressive form of demanding the long-awaited justice. A report. <laughs> At least seven Pakistani soldiers were killed in a gun attack in the country's restive Balochistan province. The attackers raided a frontier corps outpost in Harnai region of the province, which resulted in intense exchange of fire. The attack was similar to previous assaults by armed ethnic Baloch separatist groups on Pak Army personnel, and it has once again evinced the indignation of repressed people. On many occasions, the Baloch leaders have insisted that the approach of violence came after years of neglect and deprivation. This was the last option for them. The indiscriminate exploitation of Balochistan's natural resources by Pakistan, without caring for the welfare of its people, has provided the Balochs a very strong ideological foundation to oppose Islamabad's undemocratic practices. And Pakistan Army's excesses against innocent Balochs, especially ill treatment of women, folk, and children, has forced peace loving Balochs to pick up guns. When you know that you're, you are going to be abducted by Pakistan's brutal military, 
and then you will be tortured and then you will be killed. So this violence is more or less in self-defense because they, they are left with no choice. When a uh, military of Pakistan conducts raid in Baloch houses and then they rape their women, when they uh, arrest their people, they abduct them and then they torture them. What would you do? When a young child watches all this, what will he do? To save him, to save his family, he will take up arms. This is what's happening in Balochistan. The people in Balochistan are demanding sovereignty for a long time and in response to this legitimate demand, the agencies in Pakistan are eliminating separatists through their kill and dump policy. Enforced disappearances, tortures and killings. That's how Pakistan tries to crush dissent in Balochistan. The state-sponsored campaign of oppression has forced many to leave homeland Balochistan, even as lakhs of Baloch have fled overseas in search of safety. But living in exile doesn't mean a peaceful life for them. The recent mysterious death of Baloch activist Karima Baloch is a fresh example. This extrajudicial killing has added to the distress of this vulnerable community, which still has not forgotten the death of dissent Sajid Hussain in Sweden, whose body was also discovered in the same circumstances. Time and again, Baloch people have urged the international community to protect them from Pakistan Army's death squads, which have turned the land of resources into the land of missing people. This group of Pakistan's high-profile assassins has the blood of thousands of Baloch people in its hand. The world is better without Pakistan army. If you want to stop global terrorism, especially in South Asia, you have to dismember Pakistan army. The army and ISI are the biggest uh, terrorist organizations of the world who have been involved in cross-border terrorism in neighboring countries like Afghanistan, India, and they have been busy in uh, terrorizing Pakistan's own ethnic and uh, religious minorities like Sindhis, Baloch, Pakhtun, Muhajirs are being uh, terrorized by this army and military operations have been conducted in, against all these communities. Media reports about Pakistan government's plan to fence the port town of Gwadar for security reasons have further sparked a new controversy in the land of disappeared. Baloch political parties have termed it a conspiracy and vowed to resist it at all forums. This move will certainly intensify the feeling of alienation in Balochistan. The local population in Gwadar, especially fishermen, believe that they are being displaced and dispossessed in their own land. The fencing of Gwadar will validate their worst fears. Pakistan needs to be stopped from tinkering with the culture, identity and way of life of the Baloch people. Once atrocities stopped, then the issue of the rights of the Baloch people can be arbitrated in accordance with the historical realities that govern the region. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.